It's a pleasure to be with you, and you get two lecturers back to back who aren't German speaking, although I am speaking German. It's probably a form that's uh, 400 years separated from yours. <laughs> so, to go back to the last question to start with, I, I, think of, I think of three industries health, healthcare, and sick care. Health is the air you breathe, it's the water you drink, it's the things your mother told you. Health care is the effort to try to improve that health, to, to do my coach, um, I think of as health care, and sick care is what we spend all of our money on, um, and we need to change that uh, equation. So about a decade ago, um, we began thinking at IBM about what would happen in a world of healthcare that's computerized. Do you have a bad echo here? I'll step back a little bit. Is that better? Um, we began to see that there was a series of problems that really would prevent the use of technology in healthcare in the same way that technology was applied to other industries. We successfully created a computer industry in which we were able to safely launch a rocket to the moon and bring them back home and just take beautiful pictures of Pluto. But fundamentally, the problems of healthcare are so much more complicated than that. They're a gazillion times more difficult than that. Programming a computer is what we did to successfully do that. Programming a computer is what's happened with our ability to build skyscrapers the way we do, et cetera. But programming a computer and using that with rules-based has failed us in healthcare. It isn't powerful enough. It, it, it isn't able to do what we need to do. If you go to a place that really follows rules, I was just in Intermountain in, in the United States in Kaiser, most doctors would say, those rules don't apply to my patients 60% of the time. We need a whole new era of computing, and we're betting the ranch on cognitive, on the ability to probabilistically redesign the whole way we approach it. So that's one fundamental problem. The second fundamental problem is we have a sick care system in which we fundamentally pay for an episode of care, whether that episode of care is necessary or not. And because the first problem of, the, uh, of our technology not working in healthcare the way it does in banking, you know, we still use the doctor's head as the data storage repository unit, right? So we, we fundamentally pay for an episode of care, whether that episode of care is necessary or not, and we don't pay for health or managing a population, and we've not had the tools. So we began looking at the literature about a decade ago and Cal Sia, who was a pediatrician in Hawaii, was talking about the concept of a place in the delivery system where the data goes and is held accountable, the system integrator, the medical home, or the home for the data. You see, um, in the, at least in the United States context, I could have five specialists working on me with no adult supervision at all, with no oversight all prescribing five different medications with nobody accountable for the interactions of those. Do you get that? I mean, that's the situation we were facing and looking at. I mean, that kills a 747 load of patients every day, just the medical errors from that. It's unethical, it's immoral, it's unacceptable to have five prescribers and no oversight over that. So, the. Pediatricians wrote about this concept of a medical home, but the specialists that actually implemented that in the first context weren't primary care docs, they were the tr transplant surgeons. The transplant surgeons quickly realized that if they didn't get at the data, then they could, th their patients would die very quickly, right? So, so they quickly understood that whoever works on that patient had to be singing from the same sheet of music, they had to be coordinating their care. So the concept of, of transforming 
how we manage data. If, if, if simple rules-based programming a computer doesn't work, what do we need to do? So we began working on this concept. In fact, we're betting the ranch on this. We're really investing in this very heavily. We're beginning to try to figure out how to have the computer actually help us learn in the way that we as physicians would learn. Not in a programmatic way, but in a probabilistic way, helping us figure out how to get at the information. Example, I, I was with Dr. Christ, who was working with this at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and we had a patient that came to us from outside of New York City. He had 860 pages of digitized but unstructured data. And this tool can take that, that data and sort it out and make it usable for that doctor in real time. Right? It took a fellow a week to do that with 860 pages, to put that information in a way that was ingestible and digestible by the doctor. You see, we in the world of sick care don't have the time to go through those 860 pages, and we make huge mistakes because of that. I, I was in Melbourne, Australia, and, and we were playing with this technology, and the physicians decided that the most likely diagnosis of this patient who had a rash and iritis and uvi was Rye syndrome, right? Makes sense. Watson was asked that question, what's the most likely diagnosis probabilistically? And with 80, 87 degrees of certainty, it said Lyme's disease. And the difference between what the doctors did and what Watson did was that Watson noted in the record that the person had gotten their PhD from New England, a place where they were exposed to Lyme's disease. Now, you know, you could say that that was a mistake on the part of the doctor, that they didn't notice that because it was in the record, right? But, it, but, but, but the fact of the matter is, is this is not a very good data storage device. It, it, it's, it's pretty fragile. And, 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 and we're hung by a thread on, on our ability to treat difficult problems with this as our data storage device. Unfortunately, we're a thousand years behind in our reading. So the other thing that I saw this technology do was go out and search the world's literature for this particular subtype of this particular lung cancer, and it said with 93 degrees of certainty, probabilistically, choice number one was a treatment course, and, you, and then you have five options you can start with, you can go down as many as you want, but that treatment course came from a piece of literature from Israel that had been done and published the week before, right? 37 patients who had that exact genomic subtype of that lung cancer and how they responded to the medication, right? And I said to Dr. Christ, how long would it take you? How long would it take you to sort that sort of information out? And he said, maybe never. Maybe I'd hear about it at a conference. So, so this is the basic concept. The basic concept is to figure out somehow that we can no longer have to rely on this as a data storage device. Because if we continue to do that, it's going to be really difficult for us to have the kinds of breakthroughs that other industries have had, right? Does that make sense to everybody? So the, the other thing that's really driving this change, and you heard about it from both of the speakers earlier today, is this. You see? My kids, who are 30 and 34 years of age, have never seen a teller in a bank. They never will. The millennials, right? I mean, they're used to communicating in a very different way. But in healthcare, we're fundamentally stuck in a world where the last communication device is what we depend on. The last communication device was the automobile. The automobile was invented. It allowed us to do house calls, right? It allowed us to go out many miles and treat our patients. And then our patients got cars, and we stopped doing house calls, and they came to us. But fundamentally, we still rely on the interaction, the face-to-face, -face, the whites of your eyes, right? I was just up in northern Norway. I was up above the Arctic Circle in Tumsa. And there, 
the mental health consults are done on an iPad. I visited a little village in the middle of nowhere, beautiful northern lights, by the way, and, and this lady was having a consult, you know, on her iPad, and by the way, her voice patterns were being monitored, and with pretty, pretty accurate degree of certainty, it was able to give significant information to both the patient and the, and the physician about her level of manic depressive disease, right? I mean, the, the voice patterns, we've seen huge, huge breakthroughs in the ability to communicate remotely. I happen to be involved in the Danish experience for the last 15 years, and I think something like 82% of the encounters that occur now are no longer face-to-face, -face, similar in Kaiser. What's a non-face-to-face -face encounter? What's an asynchronous encounter? It can be something as simple as technology that's been around for a while where you press a pill through the aluminum foil and, the, and that sends a notice to your phone that you've at least dispensed the pill, right? We can also monitor whether the pill digests in the stomach if you want to go that far, but that technology is there and that's available. So I think, I think, I think these kinds of technologies are going to do for the doctor's mind what imaging and x-ray has done for our vision. I mean, when I started medical school so many years ago, an ultrasound was like a, a shadow, right? I mean, it, it was not easy to read. Now it's anatomy. It's fundamentally changed. And, and I, think, I think what's going to happen, and that's going to fundamentally shift how care is delivered, is that we're going to be able for the first time to get at the data, and it's going to make it clear. Math is the new medicine. Data is the new medicine. So in order to begin this journey, we tried to ask ourselves, what was fundamental? What was foundational in how care is delivered? We asked our patients, what do you want in the care that we buy for you in the sense of the US context of a company buying care. They said, we want a real relationship of trust with a healer. We want convenience, we want access. You know, we want real communication and we weren't giving them any of those things, right? You saw the data from the first slide, right? How, how, how bad we compare by cost, right? To, to the rest of Europe. Um, so we began asking our primary care physicians, what would you want to deliver? What's the covenant you'd want to change with us, the buyers, so we could support you to deliver the care you think you should deliver? They gave us these principles, the Primary Care Society of America. They're known as the joint principles of the patient Center medical home. They're immensely powerful. They're immensely powerful because they come out of the house of primary care. You see, in healthcare, technology companies think about technology. It's not about the technology. It's about the doctor and the relationship the doctor has with the patient. I mean, if you don't address the foundation of that, your technology is going to be useless. Does that make sense to you? I mean, there are so many technology companies that have graveyards with their solutions buried because they somehow think that they can magically produce some technology and that's going to change the world. You have to do two other things. You have to, you have, to have a delivery system in which that technology is actually used and you have to have a payment system where they're paid to do that. And we didn't have any of those things, right? I mean, 26% of our employees could access their primary care doctors after hours. So they'd end up in the emergency room, right? So we got these principles agreed on. And then the next thing we did in our system, in our context, is we brought 47 of the Fortune 100 companies in the United States together in a room. And we said, we're going to test these concepts and these principles. You all agree. So the next thing we did was we brought all of our health care plans in the room. So in the, in the US context, we have we the, we the employers buy health care for our employees. Um, and, and you saw the expense, about $9,000 a year. And so we brought all the health care plans in the room. And we said to them, you're going to do pilots around this concept. And you're going to play together nicely. And the healthcare plan said, we think that's a really good idea, we want to do that, but you need to help us by sort of agreeing that you'll hang together and support this change. So we said, okay, we agree. All of us 
will stop buying from you next year, right now, if you don't agree to do this. So they did pilots. These are the early results of those pilots. It's a no-brainer. When you begin to manage the population with data, when you begin to focus on a relationship with trust, you know, you begin to see a drop in the data. Aspirin, blood pressure, cholesterol, smoking, right? It's, it's, it's really fundamental. So we've been doing this now for many years. This is one of the more recent uh, pieces of data. We publish every single year in an organization called the PCCCC. We now have probably, a th I think we have over 3,000 papers that have been published on this concept. This is Michigan. This is, this is uh, about 10 million, <laughs> it's, it's, well, million? it's, it's 1.2 million patients. It's a pretty, pretty big, big rollout. It's in year six. And, and, and we continue to see improved results when we begin to use a, a relationship-based management of data. So if you're going to change the way practice is practice, if you're going to ask of them to no longer do an episode of care but to manage a population, you're going to have to change the way you pay them. If you need to pay them for an episode of care, they're going to deliver an episode of care. So we began experimenting. We got, we got 10 million from our federal government, billion from our federal government, uh, the commercials that we, the buyers, ha ha put in many, many others, probably 20 or 30 billion dollars to begin playing with concepts of payment change. So in three of these pilots, just for example, began paying the specialists to answer the emails from the primary care docs. Boy, did that change the dynamics, right? We began paying the specialists only when the answer was back for, for, you know, so we began to pull together a medical neighborhood where care was coordinated. And if they didn't behave, they didn't get paid, right? So, so boy, they all loved it, right? All of a sudden, the pediatric rheumatologist who was eight months behind, right, who, who had a waiting list of eight months, went down to a waiting list of two weeks. Because all of a sudden, they could answer a lot of those questions and the GPs could handle it. And everybody liked it because they got paid. We began, in seven of our communities, paying for service level. So we said to the primary care docs, if you answer your emails in 20 minutes, you get five times as much money. If you open your practice 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you get five times as much money, right? So we began experimenting with what drives behavior. So the conclusion we reached was there's only one way to herd a cat, and that's to move their food. So we began moving their food, right? We began putting their food around what service we wanted. So, you know, the drivers of this, you saw this same information in the first slide, are unsustainable costs. I mean, that's universal, that's all over the world. We happen to be dead last, right? We happen to be, we happen to be up here these are the years of life lived after age 40, so 15 years after age 40. What percentage of your population are still alive and at what cost? That's us. We're dead last. You know, there's a couple places where we beat you out in Germany on that first slide, um, but certainly it isn't cost. But if you look down here at Ogden, Utah, this is part of the United States the last time I looked, and, and, and they're quite comparable to the European experience and the Japanese experience. And when you look under the covers of that, what you find is robust primary care. What you find is a very different delivery system. Um, so, so we, the business community, are moving our jobs to places like Ogden, Utah in the United States. It's a really fascinating phenomenon. So the second thing that's driving this is the data, right? I mean, you guys in Europe have invested in data. We in the United States have invested in data. We spent, you know, the Recovery Act, we spent billions of dollars getting people up on, on, on e-health. It's pretty early, it's pretty primitive. Our physicians are frustrated with it. You know, it's sort of like we could be sitting here in Berlin 120 years ago and not having a discussion about data and healthcare, but having a discussion about delivering goods. And the conversation would be, should I, should I change that horse, reshoe that horse Daisy, or should I bit that newfangled thing that doesn't have a horse, even though there were no roads and there were no maps, and these were built in somebody's backyard, right? I mean, you guys were ahead of us because you had Mercedes and Benz who were earlier, but, but, but 20 years later, those who reshoed their horse Daisy were out of business. 
I mean, that's kind of where we are now in, in technology and healthcare. It's early, it's primitive. But we're beginning to get a little bit on, on top of that. And, and again, the communication is the third factor that's driving this. It's fundamentally, fundamentally going to shift who we are. So the model that I grew up in, who I am as a physician, was designed by Flexner after the German experience in the United States in 1911. The Flexner model goes out, searches the world for the best and the brightest on how they can store data. We test our students. We put them in medical school, and we make them data storage repository units, right? We make them master builders. Uh, that model has failed us. Um, and the model that we're moving to and the model that the medical home is built on is centered on, on the patient. It's team-based. It's going to be data-driven. It's a very, very different model. It's a fundamental shift in the way doctors practice. What does that mean to the doctor? It, it means that we're no longer going to be data storage repository units, so we're going to be much more like engineers. You know, we're going to have a plan for every patient. We're going to have the data to drive that plan. I mean, when I first moved to the Hudson Valley in New York uh, with IBM, its corporate headquarters, a decade or so ago, I took my cat to the veterinarian. And my cat got notified it needed its immunizations. My cat had a registry. I, I went to my primary care physician and I said, how many women in your practice are 55 and over and have had their breast exams done? And he said, Paul, I don't have a clue. I open my practice at 9 in the morning. Patients come in and they tell me their problem, and I try to do something about it, right? It's reactive. It's not proactive, you know? And so, I mean, we can at least as do as good as my cat does, right? I mean, so every person's going to... That plan might not be very complicated. That plan might be very complicated, depending on the complexity of the patient. That plan might need genomic information. It might need family information. But it might simply need, for a teenager their immunizations and how, how you get them to take their immunizations, right? But it's going to be managing a population down to an individual patient and accountable for that. So this is the covenant change that we made with organized primary care in the United States. This has now become the standard of care. You know, the Australians are doing this, the New Zealanders are doing this. I'm meeting with Jeremy Hunt later this week and next week uh, to talk about the 15 pilots they're rolling out in England. Um, our patients are the population, they're the community that we monitor. You know, we're gonna be accountable for them whether they show up or not. We're gonna manage them with data whether they show up or not. Um, care is gonna be determined by standards, right? We're gonna be measured, we're gonna be paid against those measures, we're gonna track, and we're gonna have a multidisciplinary team to manage our population. This is the shift that, that we're deeply involved in. So you see, it's not about just the technology. The technology, is really important. But the technology without changing the way doctors practice and without paying them differently is of very little value. So we're, gonna, we're asking for superb access to care, 24-7 access to care. That includes, by the way, email engagement, portal solutions. So I'm sitting at one of these practices at Kaiser and a young MA, medical assistant, the lowest paid person in the delivery system is calling a patient. And she says, I'm calling you on behalf of Dr. Gonzalez because Dr. Gonzalez loves you. Dr. Gonzalez wants you to know that we're going to follow up on these diabetic parameters today and we're going to do something about this, right? You know, I mean, that practice has one third less need to do heart surgery because somebody's proactively managing a population. That young lady hung up the phone and she said to me, this next patient I'm going to call, I saved her life because I reminded her she didn't have her mammogram, right? So if you're going to change the way practices practice and you're going to pay them differently, the third leg of the stool is how do you engage and how do you incent the patients to do the right thing? What's the science of that, right? So we began this little experiment, you know, looking at, looking at some pretty simple parameters. Probably the best treatment, the best medicine for diabetes and obesity is exercise, right? How, how do we change exercise patterns? How do we incent that? So with Michigan, we took a population and we said, okay, one third of you, we're going to give you this pedometer that's hooked up to your cell phone. We love you. You can use it. 
One third, we said, okay, we're going to give you this pedometer. We love you. You can use it. And if you use it, we're going to cut your costs of your benefit plan in half. And the third population, we said, okay, we love you. We're going to give you this pedometer. We'd like you to use it. We're going to cut your benefits in half if you do. And by the way, we're going to play games with you. We're going to try to incent you. We're going to try to send little messages to encourage you. We're going to have you join teams. We're going to try to figure out how to motivate you and provide some rewards that are not just long term. It was fascinating. What we found out was that in about six months in, these patients who didn't want to do this but did it anyway because they got a lot of money and they got a little bit of rewards, they began coming to us and saying, thank God you changed my habits. It took me about six months, but you know, I no longer would feel good about not exercising. <laughs> and then the other dirty little trick we played was we began trying to help our, our, our families, you know, our, our, our folks lose weight. And when we tried it directly with incentive programs, it didn't work so well. But when we tried encouraging them to teach their children how not to be fat, how not to be obese, it began working better. And the kids were now saying to their parents, you shouldn't eat that. You should exercise. It was just like the smoking exercise. So the science of that, this is pretty early. I went to uh, South Central Alaska Foundation where we had the worst diabetes rate in the United States. Um, and they were beginning to focus on thinking about this concept of how you engage the patient. A and they described to me that you know, we in the medical field think we're throwing a stone. We, 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 we have this treatment plan that we think we're going to treat a patient with, and that stone's going to hit the target. Little do we know, it's a bird that we're throwing. <laughs> and as soon as you let them go, they're going to fly in all different directions. How do you incent a community? How do you incent the right behavior? How do you encourage the right behavior? What's the science around that? So one of the things that, that happened there is that in this community, Storytelling by dance was really important, and the grandmothers had that. It turns out that storytelling by dance is really good exercise, right? I mean, we've made a lot of progress just beginning to think about how to engage uh, the patients in the right way. So in, in a couple of states, we, we began looking at how we can take this concept and wrap a community around it to support a patient in a community. So in the, in the state of Vermont, we took two cents out of every sick care dollar. So anytime somebody was admitted to the hospital, two cents went to an organization that supported at the community level, and Vermont has 11 communities. It's about a million patients. So our newly diagnosed diabetic, treated by a GP, can, can be given to the community coordinator, and the community coordinator will introduce them to the diabetic hiking club that meets on the weekends. We'll introduce them to the nutritionist in the grocery store that does a walkthrough of the grocery store. We'll take them down and sit them down with their local pharmacist, and their local pharmacist will go over how they can help them with medication management, right? I'm sitting there in this meeting, and a young Anglican priest says to me, never again will we let one of our members in our community suffer an amputation because they're a diabetic because we don't have a plan around the patient. That community has seen a 60% reduction in the complications of their diabetes. That's 60% less amputations, 60% less blindness, because they have a plan around every patient with data. Make sense? So, Jersey. If you think about the tools that we have here, and you think about the tools that exist at the community level to support a patient, and you put them together in some simple way, you can make a huge difference. The island of Jersey, you know, the postman goes to every home every day. Right? They had a 34% decrease in the volume of mail. They, they were going to have to lay, they were going to have to step down and only deliver mail three days a week. And, and, and the postman in Jersey said, you know, there's a demography we could help with the fact that we go to every day. Give us an iPad, <laughs> give us some technology, and we can make a difference in people's lives. So I went and spent a day with the postman there, and the first patient was Millie. She was born in 1917. And I said, what do you like about this call and check? The postman can ask five questions. If they're diabetic, they can, they can take a picture of their lower extremity. You know, I mean, they're there every day, right? Really, and, and Daisy said, I'm so lonely. I mean, it gets at the fundamental human needs, right? 
So the next, the next home we went to was Elizabeth, and Elizabeth was being monitored carefully because th there was concern about drug and alcohol use in her family and, and, and potential abuse in the family. And, and, and Elizabeth let the postman know that she was in a bit of trouble. And, and you know, so the postman notifies the system, the GP sends a note basically saying, we're gonna, we're gonna take Elizabeth down to have some tests done in the clinic, and got her out of that environment and safely got her squared away. But, I mean, think about, think about your community, think about what exists in your community, that if you begin to link some of these things together, technology, community services, social services, and healthcare services, you can begin to get at health, healthcare, and sick care in a much more meaningful way. So, in the U.S., and I'll stop with this, this slide because I, I could go on forever, but in the U.S., this experiment over the past number of years is fundamentally shifting the way we're going to pay for care. We're moving away from fee-for-service, and by 2018, 50% of care will be built on medical home, alternative payment methodology, no longer paying for an episode of care um, only, right? So we're beginning to move into a different value-based world. And, I, th and I, think, I think with that, I'll stop and take some questions, but happy. Oh, this is the experiment in, in Maryland published uh, a couple months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, we shifted payment in Maryland uh, a year ago. Uh, this change made profound difference. We began to pay the hospital capitated amount of money rather than how, how, how many butts were in the beds in the hospital. And all of a sudden it became in the interest of the hospital to keep the butts out of the beds. So we began to see a real shift in cost in just one year time frame. This was driven by the fact that the business community saw a hundred, Maryland was 126% higher in cost than the average of the United States and we were moving all of our jobs out, right? So they began to take this seriously. I'll stop and take some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul, for sharing some of your experience with us. And uh, I was deeply impressed uh, also about the last thing you mentioned, how we should reshift or restructure the payment systems. And when you see the figures, in a sense, going away from fee for service, which is also in this country to consider to be one of the really major challenges that we have a payment system which does not work. We have time for questions to Paul. Yes, Sophia. Paul, thanks for uh, a wonderful and inspiring talk. I have questions, and maybe I've been along, around for too long, but um, what is the difference between the patient-centered medical home that you describe and at Wagner's care model? And looking at the importance of patient-centeredness and data driving change and technology used in sophisticated integrated care, Aren't you describing the Kaiser system? So to answer the first question, Ed Wagner is, uh, is one of my heroes. He's based in Seattle, and he designed the Wagner chronic disease model. So, so the patient center medical home uses the core concept of Ed Wagner's chronic disease model. It also uses Cal Sia's concept of the medical home, which comes out of pediatrics. And the third element of, of that, of the medical home, patient center medical home model, and the principles are, uh, uh, in terms of just the structure of it, would be the Bodenheimer, uh, Kevin Grembach, advanced primary care, the 10 building blocks of primary care. So, so those are the components that make it up. But when the primary care societies themselves gave it this name, patient center medical home, um, it was really the principles that, that were the key. It was an agreement that they were going to deliver that and accept companies paying them to deliver that rather than simply just this is the model. Um, how does it differ from Kaiser? So, so about five years ago, um, I, I, we at the time had 32,000 employees or so that were covered by Kaiser within our IBM system. And when I would ask my patients who their doctor was, they would say Kaiser. You know, and so I met with George Halverson and Jack Cochran, and I said, you know, that's not the kind of care we want. 
you're missing the point. We want them to say our doctor is Gonzalez and he happens to work for Kaiser. <laughs> because we really think it's important to have a relationship with trust. And they agreed to go with me to Denmark and see what I thought was the best primary care in the world. And they spent a week with me in Denmark looking at that primary care delivery system. And what impressed the heck out of them was that there was not a patient that we met. There was not a consumer on the street. There wasn't a taxi cab driver that didn't know the name of their primary care doctor. You say, what's your name of your primary care doctor? And they say, that's a stupid question, but it's Dr. Hans. <laughs> and then they start telling you stories about them. So, 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 so I think that that, I think that the ability to get at having an infrastructure that's large enough like Kaiser to deliver the data and having a relationship that's small enough that, that the patients really know their doctor is the key to this. That's the model I'm looking for. You know, when I survey my employees and I say, you know, who do you trust the most in your life? They will say, my family and my doctor. And, and, I, and, and growing up in Africa, my parents w worked in Africa when I was a child, that power of the, of the relationship and the need to have somebody in your life who's going to be there when you're sick is immensely important. And, and if you undercut that, if you don't make that the foundation of a delivery system, you're losing a lot, I think. Does that answer that? It does, but at Kaiser, you do know your primary care provider. You do now. Yeah, yeah, you do now, absolutely. They've really worked on that. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, if I could have Kaiser where I live, I would. I mean, anybody who lives in the Kaiser catchment area, I think, you know, they have, I, I thought the Danes probably had the best primary care, and Kaiser probably has as good an integrated care as, as anywhere in the world. Pretty impressive. Further questions? Just one, one question about the role of IBM. How looks your business model in the whole story? So... I think, you know, we've invested a huge amount of time, energy, and resources in trying to link clinical care with technology. And the foundation of our basic business model is we think, I mean, when I sit around with my bosses at IBM, they ask a fundamentally different question than I think most companies. Most companies ask how I can make a profit. My bosses say, how can I make a profit? and do something different that nobody else can do, right? How do we do that and not be a me too company, right? So, I mean, we're, we're fundamentally think that we have to shift and support the, the sick care system to move to a cognitive model of care. Um, and we're pretty much betting the ranch on that, right? We've, we're creating a very integrated healthcare industry. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if it's successful, but it, it's not easy. Thank you so much, Paul, again. And anybody who wants to read a little bit more, somebody wrote a book about this called The Familiar Physician. It's a pretty easy read. It's the story of the whole sort of 10-year experience of trying to drive change in the US context. Thank you. <laughs>